The Statue of Liberty is one of the most famous monuments in the world. Dedicated in 1886, it has become an icon not just of New York City, but of the entire country, and a symbol of welcome to immigrants arriving by sea. But building a structure of this scale is not easy, and securing enough money for the project proved a serious problem. By 1885, work on the pedestal was threatened by lack of funds, and sufficient donations to complete it were only raised after publisher Joseph Pulitzer initiated a campaign in his newspaper, appealing to the American people to contribute whatever they could. Thanks to his efforts, more than 120,000 individual donations were raised, allowing work to continue. But over the course of New York's history, there have been several other planned monuments that could have similarly redefined the image of the city that weren't as fortunate. In this video, we will explore some of New York's most impressive monuments that were never built. Already in 1802, New Yorkers had called for the construction of a memorial to George Washington, and 30 years later, an association was formed to realize this ambition. It managed to collect a considerable sum of donations, but years went by without much else happening. Then, in 1843, it was reformed, and a design by architect Calvin Pollard was adopted. According to this scheme, the monument was to be a massive 425 feet or 130 meters tall Gothic tower, almost double the height of any other building in the city. Set to be constructed on Union Square, it promised to be the noblest monument in the known world. Inside, there would be several rotundas with exhibitions of sculptures and paintings commemorating the Revolution, and Washington in particular, while subsidiary galleries illuminated through stained glass windows would serve the more utilitarian purposes of a free library, studios for artists, and an astronomical observatory. The build cost was estimated at around $400,000. The project soon faced public protests, particularly from other architects who were against the seemingly arbitrary manner in which the association had selected Pollard's design and demanded an open competition. It was also attacked on aesthetic grounds. One art journal was impressed by its scale, but complained that, quote, more wretched stuff for Gothic was never perpetrated. Pollard's choice of Gothic was further criticized as preposterous for Americans. It was observed that, quote, a Gothic monument in honor of Washington is the very sublime of nonsense, and we are a little in doubt whether a monument of the Gothic order is in perfectly congruous association with the character and history of Washington. Eventually, independent counterproposals began to be circulated. Among them was a classical project by Robert Kerr, intended to serve as, quote, a place of public resort, a lounge, or promenade. It consisted of three superimposed circular colonnades of varying heights on a stepped base. The different levels contained galleries and terraces for busts and paintings of Washington and other national heroes. Also included was a modest historical library. Another similarly ambitious design was submitted by the American sculptor Thomas G. Crawford and the English architect Frederick Catherwood. This monument would have consisted of a colossal cast-iron statue of Washington, 75 feet or 22 meters tall, atop a granite pedestal itself 55 feet or 17 meters in height. Following the barrage of criticism, the project lost momentum, and it seemed like it would be abandoned for good. But in 1847, it was revived again, and an open design competition was held. This time, the Common Council granted the association ground for the monument in Hamilton Square, a now lost public square on the Upper East Side. A visitor to the association's office wrote of the submissions that, quote, All are on a scale of impracticable splendor and magnitude, and with two exceptions, all execrable. One by La Fever, a combination of obelisk, church steeple, and gas house chimney intended to look Egyptian and 500 feet high is horribly ugly, but has a sort of knowing, original, preposterous nightmare look that's rather taking. 
Dissatisfied with the results of its competition, the trustees of the association decided not to adopt any of the projects. Instead, they went back to Pollard's original design, and on the 19th of October 1847, a procession to Hamilton Square celebrated the laying of the cornerstone on the anniversary of the surrender of Cornwallis at Yorktown. Inevitably, objections to Pollard's design reappeared in the press. We cannot find terms to speak in sufficient contempt, wrote Walt Whitman in an editorial in the Brooklyn Daily Eagle. By December, the association began to accept designs again. One of the more complex schemes in this round was submitted by William Ross Wallace. Guarded by statues symbolizing the continents, the monument featured a large pedestal covered with reliefs of Washington as the man, the revolutionary leader, the president of the United States, and the farmer of Mount Vernon. On top of the pedestal stands a monopteral structure of 13 columns interspersed with statues of the signers of the Declaration of Independence. Above rose a large globe, emblematic of the world, which, quote, must finally be redeemed by the genius of Washington asserting the principles of the American Revolution. At the summit of the whole structure soared a colossal statue of the first president. By the end of 1848, the question of the design could finally be settled for good. By then, enough votes had been cast by the citizens of New York for the association to announce that the subscribers to the Washington Monument had selected La Fever's plan for an Egyptian obelisk. Earlier that year, however, work had begun on another Washington Monument in the capital, which also took the form of an ancient Egyptian obelisk and was also projected to be 500 feet or 150 meters tall. This had caused public interest in the project to wane. According to Lefevre, although his design was set to be erected in granite on Murray Hill, it was never executed for lack of sufficient funds. It would not be until 1856 that New York's first public monument to Washington, a bronze equestrian statue in Union Square, was unveiled. A triumphal arch was also put up in his honor in 1895. Standing in Washington Square, it was designed by architect Stanford White and commemorates the centennial of his 1789 inauguration as President of the United States. In 1929, another project appeared that could have added a monumental obelisk to New York's skyline. At 800 feet, or about 240 meters tall, this proposal for a World War I memorial in Battery Park would have been considerably taller than the Washington Monument. Designed by Eric Googler, it featured a visitor's gallery and a beacon roughly 600 feet above sea level. The obelisk would have been visible not only from the harbor, but along Broadway through all of Lower Manhattan and beyond. The idea was eventually killed off by Robert Moses, since it conflicted with his planned Brooklyn Battery Bridge, another project that never came to fruition. This was just one of many proposed memorials to the war. In September 1918, two months before it ended, a design by Don Barber appeared in the periodical The American Architect. Sided next to Grant's tomb along Riverside Drive, it consisted of a water gate where foreign guests could be greeted, leading up to a stadium and plaza, and then to a number of war monuments on the upper part of the composition. The idea of a water gate would reappear in several other designs published in the following months. This includes one by Otto Eggers and E. H. Rosengarten, which would have been located about 10 blocks down. Eggers motivated his design by writing that the idea of building a memorial in Central Park, which was also discussed at the time, would be analogous to ushering guests through the back door into the reception room, whereas in the Riverside design, the guests are immediately welcomed at the front door by the president, mayor, and other dignitaries. A third iteration of this idea was proposed by the brothers Franklin and Arthur Ware and their partner M.D. Metcalf. They chose the more logical site of Battery Park at the southern tip of Manhattan, a natural debarkation point for a ship entering New York Harbor within sight of the Statue of Liberty. From here, a massive gate would open up to Broadway, leading you out of the Battery to City Hall and providing the perfect triumphal way for visiting dignitaries. Meanwhile, Mayor John Hyland had set up a committee on a permanent war memorial, which began advertising for proposals. By November 1919, 
It filed a report concluding that none of the forwarded schemes were found to their satisfaction, but they did recommend three general initiatives that they believed would form the basis of future planning. These were a Liberty Bridge erected over the Hudson River, a Liberty Hall, the development of Madison Square Garden to become the largest convention center in the world, and a Liberty Arch erected near Central Park or Madison Square Park. A composite image of this scheme seen here was made by the architect W. A. Somerville. The bridge was never really popular. It wasn't regarded as a fitting enough tribute to New York's sacrifice, and besides, it would mostly be of benefit to the residents of New Jersey. The notion of a Liberty Hall, on the other hand, did attract a lot of public support. However, the Victory Hall Association, who had proposed the plans, withdrew from the committee's competition to develop the scheme on their own. They envisioned a grand building inspired by the Parthenon in Athens that would consist of a 20,000-seat auditorium, meeting rooms, swimming pool, and rifle range, as well as large bronze plaques that would record the names of the dead. However, its prominent location on a city-owned plot next to Grand Central Station brought censure from politicians who argued that the scheme was a cynical means of depriving the city of income and would only benefit the rich hoteliers and club owners in the area. To counter such claims, the association set out an ambitious plan to secure for its site the body of the unknown soldier. The failure to do this, as well as to secure funding or combat the perceived limitations of the plan, saw the scheme falter and fail by the mid-1920s. The only remaining viable option was the Liberty Arch, but it consistently failed to get sufficient political and popular support. In April 1922, the Permanent War Memorial Committee decided to rework a previous scheme to make the Lower Reservoir in Central Park the city's war memorial, but this project was also called to a halt two years later. Since no agreement could be made as to its form or function, New York never built a central memorial to World War I. That being said, the dedication of spaces, from squares to streets and parks, was used as a way to commemorate it. In addition, many smaller monuments were actually built, ranging from so-called doughboy statues depicting soldiers to the Bronx Victory Column in Pelham Bay Park. In the early 20th century, Fort Wadsworth in Staten Island was set to become the site for the National American Indian Memorial. It would have featured a giant statue of a Native American chief, extending his hand to the sea in a sign of peace. Designed by Daniel Chester French, who is also known for his work on the Lincoln Memorial, the statue would have stood atop a Neo-Aztec pyramid, with an Egyptian Revival-style complex serving as its foundation, all designed by Thomas Hastings, a partner at the firm Carrara and Hastings. The scheme included a museum, an art gallery, a library, and garden grounds, and would cover every aspect of Native American life, from regalia and artwork to architecture. Rising 165 feet, or about 50 meters, the Native American chief would have been taller than the Statue of Liberty, and with its location near the entrance to New York Harbor, the memorial would have been the first site to greet immigrants arriving in the city. The memorial was the brainchild of Rodman Wanamaker, a department store magnate and patron of the arts, who beginning in 1908 had sponsored a series of expeditions to document Native American tribes and generate public interest and support for American Indians' right to citizenship. On May 12, 1909, shortly after the second expedition ended, a dinner was held at the New York City restaurant Sherry's to honor Buffalo Bill Cody, whose performance was being held in the New York Hippodrome. That night, Cody proposed a giant Native American statue, which Wanamaker had suggested to him, that would be set along the New York Harbor and would serve to welcome everyone to this shore. Many of the guests at the dinner party enthusiastically supported the idea, and it was also met with general support from the public. The project evolved over time. In 1910, one version foresaw a peace memorial, or Great Bronze Column of Staten Island, that would sit above Pavilion Hill in St. George and Tompkinsville, and function as a Western Hemisphere counterpart to the Hague's Peace Palace. By 1912, however, the site was set to the old Fort Tompkins within Fort Wadsworth, and the scheme by Thomas Hastings and Daniel Chester French was produced. The following year, a groundbreaking ceremony was held, 
attended by President Taft and 30 indigenous leaders. Despite this, the memorial was never realized. Wanamaker was unable to raise sufficient funds and eventually lost interest. The project was further overshadowed by the entry of the United States into World War I. After the war's conclusion, Wanamaker moved on to chair the Committee on a Permanent War Memorial instead, and became heavily involved in that project. The motivations behind the National American Indian Memorial were varied. Many Americans viewed it as a celebration of victory over Native Americans, while others considered it, quote, a constant reminder of the vanishing race to whom we are indebted for the great free gift of a continent and some thought the monument would memorialize admirable qualities attributed to natives and serve as a lasting beacon of American ideals. Arizona John Burke, who managed Cody, announced that America owed at least an apology for the exigencies of civilized man and his cupidity in appropriating the red man's land, though he later clarified that of course it was all done in the name of progress and God had foreordained that it should be so. But let us build this monument as a lasting tribute to the dying race and to the genius of the man who suggested it. The actor and activist Chauncey Yellow Robe, by contrast, condemned the project in 1914, stating, We see a monument of the Indian in New York Harbor as a memorial to his vanishing race. The Indian wants no such memorial monument, for he is not yet dead. The name of the Native American Indian will not be forgotten as long as the rivers flow and the hills and mountains shall stand. And though we have progressed, we have not vanished. <laughs>